Hi everybody, Kristen here, and welcome to the first Murder and Myths Extended Mythology episode 1A, A Translator for the Valkyrie. In the regular podcast episodes, I take on the role of a storyteller for the myths, and I don't want to break up their narrative with too much explanation of the characters or locations unless it's absolutely necessary to the plot. However, as you can imagine with mythology, unless you're already familiar with the world we are traveling in, there is a lot of deeper meaning that can be missed. So, we'll meet here once a month and expand the world view of our tales. Today I want to revisit the poem that Brynhild tells Sigurd when they first meet, and hopefully explain a little bit better exactly what Brynhild was telling Sigurd in that part of the story. For the podcast, I used the translation by William Morris and Eric Magnuson from their 1888 work, The Story of the Volsungs. Part of the reason I chose that version was because it's included in Project Gutenberg's The Story of the Volsungs, which can be reproduced and redistributed with almost no restrictions. As such, I was able to include the translation as part of A Mighty Flame's show notes on our website, as well as on our Patreon page. If you want to follow along with today's episode, head over there now and grab it. I'll start by reading a stanza, and then we will explore what it meant. I will preface this by saying I am not a scholar in Norse mythology, so I am not making any definitive statements about what the original authors intended. And for the sake of brevity, I won't be going into the multitude of issues with the source material for our understanding of Norse culture, except to say that a lot of it was written down after Christianity had already taken hold. With that being said, let's join Brynhild. Beer bring I to thee, fair fruit of the Birnies' clash. Mixed it is mightily, mingled with fame, brimming with bright lays and pitiful runes. Wise words, sweet words, speech of great game. Here, Brynhild is giving Sigurd a full cup of mead. Fair fruit of the Birnie's clash. What's a Birnie, you might ask? Well, a Birnie is a type of chainmail, and this line is alternatively translated as tree of battle, which is an interesting way of saying warrior. So, as she is giving Sigurd the mead, she is recognizing him for what he is, a warrior of great renown. The rest of that stanza explains that the mead has been mixed with strength and fame, full of magic, charms, and happy words. Basically, something you would want to drink. Runes of war know thou, if great thou wilt be. Cut them on the hilt of hardened sword, some on the brand's back, some on its shining side, twice named Tyr therein. Here, she is telling Sigurd, if you want to win in battle, carve victory runes on your sword. Carve them on the hilt, on the furrow, and on the blade. Tyr is a Norse god of war, and one who I'll surely be telling more stories about on the podcast. And thus, Brynhild is instructing Sigurd to invoke him to ensure victory. I also like to think there's a little bit of a double meaning here as the Norse rune for T is also called Tyr, so maybe we should be carving that on the sword as well. Sea runes good at need, learnt for ship saving. For the good health of the swimming horse, on the stern cut them. Cut them on the rudder blade, and set flame to shaven oar. How so big be the sea hills, how so blue beneath. Hail from the main, then comest thou home. This is one of my favorite stanzas in the poem, as I come from a line of seafaring folk. The swimming horse is a clever way of referring to a ship, and if you want to keep the ship safe on the waters, then carve the runes on the stern and the rudder and burn them onto the oars. And then there won't be any breaking waves that you can't escape safely from. 
Word runes learn well, if thou wilt that no man pay back grief for the grief thou gavest. Wind thou these, weave thou these, cast thou these all about thee, at the thing where the folk throng, unto the doomful farthing. The thing where the folk throng, unto the full doom farring. This specifically was one of the lines that made me want to cover the poem here. I mean, really, what could that even mean? Well, this part refers to a gathering of people, the thing, which is like a tribunal where you could go seek judgment. Here, Brunhild is explaining that if Sigurd learns the speech runes and casts them about himself, his adversary at the court will not seek out vengeance, which, if you know anything about the cycle of revenge killings that happen throughout the saga of the Volsungs, you know this is very sage advice for Sigurd to heed. Of ale runes know the wisdom, if thou wilt that another's wife should not betray thine heart that trusteth, cut them on the mead horn, and on the back of each hand, and nick an end upon thy nail. So, if Sigurd were to decide to have an affair with another man's wife, and does not want that secret betrayed, he should learn the ale runes. Then, all he needs to do, carve them on the drinking horn, and on the back of his hand, and carve the rune for N on his fingernail. The rune for N, Noth, is also the word for need. The need is for the trust to remain unbroken here. Ale have thou heed, to sign from all harm. Leak lay thou in the liquor, then I know for sure, never cometh to thee, mead with hurtful matters mingled. Leak lay thou in the liquor. More than being fun to say, is referring to the belief that leeks can counteract witchcraft. So, if you don't want to unknowingly drink mead that has been cursed, just throw a leek in your ale horn, and you're golden. Help rune shalt thou gather, if skill thou wouldest gain, to loosen child from low-laid mother. Cut be in the hands hollow, wrapped the joints round about. Call for the good folks, gain some helping. Here, Brynhild recommends that if Sigurd should want to save a woman's life who is having difficulty giving birth, he should learn the help runes. He should then carve them into his palms, wrap them around his joints, and ask the fates to help. Learn the bow runes wisdom, if leech lore thou lovest, and wilt about wound searching. On the bark be they scored, on the buds of trees, whose boughs look eastward ever. If you want to be a healer, then learn the branch runes. Sometimes this is also translated to limb runes, which I think makes less sense in the context of the rest of the stanza, because it goes on to say, if you want to heal wounds, carve the runes onto the bark of a tree, or a tree whose boughs faced eastward. It was believed that by carving the runes onto the bark, the sickness would be transferred from the ill person and onto the tree. Thought runes shall thou deal with, if thou wilt be of all men, fairest souled, wit and wisest, these arted, these first cut, these first took to the heart high rocked. Learn the runes if you want to be the cleverest of men. Plain and simple. Hropt is another name for Odin, from whom our knowledge of the runes comes from. Here we learn that Odin read them, Odin carved them, and Odin thought them up. On the shield they were scored, that stands before the shining god, on early waking's ear, on all knowing's hoof, on the wheel which runneth under Rognir's chariot, on Slepnir's jaw teeth, on the sleigh's traces. The shining god here is the sun. Early waking's ear and all-knowing's hoof refer to Arvak and Alsvith, the horses that pull the cart of the sun across the sky. Rognir is one of Odin's many, many, many names. Seriously, 
He has so many names. Here, we see that the runes were carved on the wheel of his chariot. They were also carved on the teeth of Odin's eight-legged horse Slepnir, who, by the way, is also Loki's son? But that's a tale for another time. The runes are also carved onto the reins of his sled. Some translations say that it is Thor's chariot rather than Odin's in this stanza. But since we go from that line right into talking about Odin's horse and not the goats that pull Thor's chariots, I prefer the version that summons Odin here. On the rough bear's paws and on Bragi's tongue, on the wolf's claws and on eagle's bill, on bloody wings and bridge's end, on loosing palms and pity's path. This stanza continues telling of all the places where the runes have been carved. Most are self-explanatory, but I do want to mention a couple of the lines here. Bragi is the god of poetry, and it makes sense that he would have runes carved onto his tongue with how skilled he is with skaldic speech. Loosing palms refer to a helper's hand, and pity's path a healer's footprint. On glass and on gold, and on goodly silver, in wine and in wart, and the seat of the witch wife, on Gungir's point, and Granny's bosom, and the Norn's nail, and the neb of the night owl. Just continuing the list of rune imbued items. Here we have treasures, wine, beer, and the witch's chair. On Gungir's point refers to Odin's magical spear made by the dwarves and considered one of the gods' greatest treasures so it makes sense that Odin would have carved runes upon it. Grani is Sigurd's horse, who is also a descendant of Sleipnir, and by proxy Loki. And the Norn's nail refers to the fingernails of the fates, and finally, the beak of an owl. All these so cut were shaven and sheared, and mingled in with holy mead, and set upon wide ways and now. Some abide with the elves, some abide with the Aesir, or with the wise Vanir, some still hold the sons of mankind. So, after Odin cut these runes into wood, he shaved the wood away, and mixed the rune-infused shavings into the holy mead and sent it about. He sent some to the elves, some to the Aesir, who are the principal pantheon of the Norse religion that Odin and Thor and Tyr belong to, some to the Vanir, who are another pantheon within the Norse religion that was once at war with the Aesir, that deities such as Freya and Njorthir belong to. And some of the holy mead was sent to us humans here in Midgard. These be the book runes and the runes of good help, and all the ale runes, and the runes of much might, to whomso they may avail, unbewildered, unspoilt, they are wholesome to have. Thrive thou with these then, when thou hast learnt their lore, till the gods end thy life days. Brynhild is now reiterating the types of runes, and saying that they will be helpful to those who know them. If you know them, and can use them correctly, you should, until the gods are dead. Now shalt thou choose thee, even as choice is bidden. Sharp steel's rotten stem, choose song or silence, to seek each in thy heart, all hurt has been heeded. Brynhild tells Sigurd that he must now choose to speak or remain silent, to choose her or go against fate. So there we have it. Hopefully that helped you to understand the poem a little better and why Sigurd was so impressed with the knowledge that Brynhild possessed that he had to vow to marry her.
I've included some information in the show notes about the two runes we specifically mentioned here, Nauth and Tyr. Feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have, either on the webpage or by reaching out via Twitter at Murder and Myths. If you like the podcast, please leave us a review or a rating on iTunes. Those help us immensely. If you enjoyed this extended mythology episode, head over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash murderandmyths to see how you can continue to have access to this monthly patron perk. Join us next week for Murder and Myths Episode 2, Rub-A-Dub-Dub, Thanks for the Grub. And as always, come for the murder and stay for the myths.